Okay, Chris, uh, before you begin, and just for people who just got on, uh, we've got a, a bill out of Washington that's going to make a world of difference for Vermonters in the country. And uh, I heard it's 600 pages long. Uh, the sections that we're involved in, I'm sure, are equally uh, detailed. I, um, we're, this is our first hearing about it. So we're going to use this next hour, an hour and a half to understand exactly uh, what it does and um, where there may be holes if possible and how it dovetails with Vermont law and trying to find out whether there are things that we can do to uh, either improve on or whether any legislation is necessary. Uh, so with that, I'd like to Turn it over to Chris. Could you identify yourself for the record? And of course. Uh, we'll start moving it along. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Chris Saunders with the Office of U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy. I work on business and economic development. I'm a field representative for the senator here in Vermont. Uh, so, as you mentioned, Senator, uh, last night, early this morning, the Senate cleared a two trillion dollar bill that uh, really includes uh, a broad variety of assistance. I think folks have labeled this as stimulus, but we're trying to um, make sure that people realize that this is really about stabilization and recovery, that there will be a time for stimulus, but right now with so many systems and p individuals and families uh, struggling to stay afloat, that what we're trying to do now from the federal level is, is offer stabilization awesome. more than, than stimulus. Uh, so, uh, it's a really broad ranging package. Uh, Senator Leahy estimates that it'll deliver about $2 billion worth of assistance to the state of Vermont in various forms. Uh, some of that will be through traditional programs that are delivered via formula and others will be through individual assistance to Vermonters and social safety net programs. Uh, the biggest chunk of that is going to come from something that's comparable to what we passed in 2009 in the recovery bill that was a fiscal stabilization fund for states. So the senator was adamant that uh, small states like Vermont get a fair treatment through that pool of money. So $1.25 billion will be coming to the state. Uh, there's pretty broad discretion for the administration to determine how to allocate those funds. But the idea is there's a recognition of uh, lost revenues coming into the state and to local communities, and those resources will be able to uh, patch holes in state budgets due to losses uh, related to COVID. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get out of head of what the governor is thinking, but um, I'm sure there will be some opportunity to be creative and think about how to best uh, help states, uh, help help communities and uh, entities that are really struggling. Uh, as you noted, there's some uh, important new provisions around unemployment insurance. Uh, I think that the headline is that uh, for the first time, the federal government is going to allow uh, self-contractors, uh, independent contractors, self-employed gig economy workers uh, to utilize the unemployment insurance program. Those with limited work histories will be eligible and they will be eligible both for the increased benefit, which is a $600 increase over, over what is offered now, as well as extended benefits. And the federal government will be picking up uh, the full cost of these, these benefits. There are a couple other important programs that come in will, that Chris, will can be- I, Can I ask you a question on that? Of course, yeah. Quickly. yeah. When you said the independent contractors would get, um, Exactly what would they get? Would they just get the 600 or they do some calculation on their past earnings and get that as well? Um, that's, that's correct. They're, um, they'll, they'll be eligible for a regular benefit plus uh, the $600 on, on top of that. So yes, uh, whatever, whatever uh, way they can document their, their income, uh, that'll, that'll be used uh, by DOL and I'll, I'll let DOL speak to their processes and how they plan to roll this out. But that's my understanding is, um, yes, they'd be eligible to the 600 on top of whatever they might normally receive. But that, so, what they normally would receive would not come out of the UI trust fund. It would come from federal dollars directly, right? Yes. Okay. So may I just ask on that, uh, Chris, nice beard. 
um, <laughs> the, uh, so the money that will come, go to the self-employed and independent contractors, that will be funneled through our departments of labor in each state? Uh, yes, it, yes, it will be, that's correct. Yeah. So it will be able to be managed slightly separately from our trust fund, which is really in trust for the people who've paid into it. Um, I'm gonna defer to DOL on that, but that's my understanding. Okay. Because I think that's important for all the people who feel like they've paid into Amen. it at great yep. sacrifice in some cases. Yep, un un understood, understood. Um, so I, I know you had Josh Hanford on earlier uh, today. Uh, there's uh, a number of discretionary appropriations programs that, that come via formula. Uh, the state's going to receive $4.7 million in CDBG uh, funding and they will be eligible to receive more. There, there's gonna be a, a distribution based on economic disruption that uh, will still be determined on, on how that's gonna be allocated. Uh, there's gonna be about $5 million that comes into the uh, CAP agencies uh, through the Community Services Block Grant uh, to help uh, deal with the consequences of increasing numbers of unemployed and those experiencing uh, economic disruption in, in their lives. Um, there's some uh, funding. Vermont will receive $4.3 million uh, through the Child Care Development Block Grant uh, to help uh, pay for child care assistance for those uh, critical health care sector workers and emergency responders that are deemed essential during this time. There's going to be $4.6 million uh, through emergency solutions grants uh, that comes in to help uh, rapid rehousing of people. And then um, assistance as well for some of our uh, transportation systems that make sure people are able to get to jobs. We know that transit providers in the state have, are seeing uh, massive losses because people aren't taking public transit. So the state's going to get about $20 million in a variety of public transit uh, resources uh, to support to support public transit. Um, there's a host of other things, other things that will uh, that the state or local communities have utilized through USA, USDA Rural Development, the Economic Development Administration, uh, a lot, lots of good resources that'll be out there to, to come. Uh, but those are the highlights that I wanted to share on behalf of the Senator with you for right now. Could you explain the um, cash payments to, I guess, every citizen mm -hmm. Is that, that goes above and beyond the unemployment or the self-employment dollars? Yes. Uh, yes. So there is a uh, cash payment. IRS has uh, advised us this morning that they're still trying to determine exactly how they will roll this out, um, but they will, um, singles, uh, individuals are eligible for up to $1,200, uh, $2,400 for a married couple filing a joint return uh, with a addition of $500 per qualifying child dependent under the age of 17. Uh, so, you know, if you were totaling it up, a family of four could receive $3,400. Uh, the rebate has a phase out. That, sorry, that's that's with incomes of seventy five thousand or less, right? Yeah, I was just getting to that. So the the okay. rebate begins to phase out at five percent um, for incomes with a adjusted gross income above seventy five thousand dollars for an uh, individual, uh, a or one hundred fifty thousand for for joint filers. Um, so yes, it does decrease uh, based on the more that you file. Um, we have been hearing concerns from those that, that don't file. Um, so if you receive social security benefits, uh, IRS is gonna be working with the social security administration to make sure that recipients uh, get checks and working on trying to figure out how non-filers uh, will be eligible to receive uh, a rebate. It's likely that they will need to file in order to receive uh, receive a rebate if they traditionally right. haven't, but the IRS is going to be looking to use any other uh, public sector information that they can have to get resources to people. So, so that on that, on that, um, that money, I've read that there's a tax credit. 
Can you describe how that works? Um, you're, you're talking about a tax credit specifically for the, the IRS rebate? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, effectively, it's, it's just a, a credit that is proactively issued as a rebate um, is, is the way I understand it, that they are kind of just forward, it, forward paying the, the credit that you might normally claim the way you would a child tax credit uh, at the when when you're going through your regular filing. Okay, but the the check, so to speak, would be in the mail. Uh, yes, they are looking <laughs> at if it's possible to utilize direct deposit uh, for those that um, either filed their 2019 return or uh, if that would work for 2018. Uh, recognizing that not everybody might have the same banking information from year to year. Okay. And Michael, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, Going back to the uh, emergency solution grants, you said for rapid rehousing, would that address uh, payment for landlords who um, have had non-payment of rent from their tenants? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think uh, you know we used to call this program emergency shelter grants, and I think it is targeted, uh, my understanding at the moment is that it's targeted towards assisting folks that are predominantly homeless. So if, I think what Burlington is doing in terms of setting up temporary housing at North Beach, able to utilize resources for, for that type of emergency shelter. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. There was one other program that I wanted to mention, and I'm sure like you, uh, all getting calls from constituents that are business owners. Exactly. Uh, there's 350, uh, 377 billion, depending on how you count it, uh, for a new SBA loan program that would be available to uh, businesses and nonprofits that uh, would include loan forgiveness. You know, like any government, the federal government traditionally has not made grants to uh, private businesses, uh, but this would convert for the first time a portion of a loan a business takes uh, to uh, effectively a grant via loan forgiveness um, for paying payroll, for paying debt obligations they have, rent, uh, other, other things they need to stay afloat. And it will uh, include eight weeks of forgiveness based on the origination date of the loan. Um, I almost hesitate to get into too many of the details because we really need SBA to be out there talking about the program. They have promised that they will be doing that as soon as the president signs the bill and they um, have all the rules and regulations in front of them. Um, but I think this is a really important step that we heard loud and clear from businesses that said, in order to survive this, we need um, some sort of relief. We don't need a large new loan when we don't know when we might be able to open our doors and when revenues are going to return to normal. So that is one portion. There's also a uh, program, an SBA program that I believe you all are familiar with that the Agency of Commerce helped certify and stand up in conjunction with SBA, the Emergency Disaster Loan Program. Uh, there is a change to that program where businesses applying to it will be eligible for a $10,000 grant upfront pretty much as soon as they submit an application and that money will not need to be repaid. So uh, there are gonna be differing loan programs out there. Uh, the SBA uses the commercial uh, lenders to get these programs out the door and get these resources out the door. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot more to come on this, but I know you all, you've, many of you have sent us uh, businesses that have been concerned. And so uh, this is a response to those business owners to try and keep them, uh, keep them running. So is there an allocation to Vermont for the 377 billion? There, there is not. This is a, a national program. Uh, folks will th work through the SBA district office in Vermont and uh, through, through uh, lenders in Vermont that are certified to work with the SBA. Uh, there will be other lenders that come online, including uh, uh, those that are purely electric or uh, electronic uh, banks. They, they will be able to participate, um, but there is not a set aside of a specific amount for the state of Vermont. And does there, 
are there any strings attached to strings might not be the right word yeah. to the 377 billion or the ten thousand dollar grant does the yeah. does that money have to be passed through for payroll or some commitment to reopen yeah, yeah. um there there are fewer restrictions on the ten thousand dollar grant up front through the disaster program the loan forgiveness program there will be a tie to the level of employment that a business maintains uh, when they take the loan from the period before. So effectively, the goal is for them to keep as many people on payroll as possible, and then the loan forgiveness will be reduced by a soon to be determined amount uh, based on how their employment level compares before and after them taking the loan. Uh, we, we know that for restaurants, I've been talked to hundreds of them, over the last couple of days where they have laid off all their employees and they're trying to figure out how they will participate in this program and what steps they'll need to take to, to get uh, people back working, et cetera, to make sure that they qualify. So that's a, uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail that with the commissioner, but um, that was a question that I keep hearing is, you know, do I lay off my workers? Do I furlough them? Do I keep them on? and pay them where they have little to do. And I guess we'd eventually like to know how these loans to businesses and nonprofits, what the requirements would be there and whether what the, what the proper step for these business owners is right now. Yep, absolutely. That is, that is a massive question about how effective this program will be. And our goal is to have some sort of very public event with the Small Business Administration as soon as they are able to give people clarity, whether that's a statewide telephone town hall or, or some other uh, venue for them to be able to do questions and answer with, uh, with businesses. Okay. Um, Chris, thank you very much. I hope you can stay on because I think we'll bounce back and forth in the next hour or so with questions. Does anybody have any more questions for Chris? Right Michael, now? going back to unemployment insurance, how are small business owners affected by that? Are they able to, to um, participate in UI under the federal program? Your question is, are the owners themselves Correct. able to participate? Yeah. Um, that is a question I, I don't know the answer to. I, I, I would happily defer to DOL if, if they understand uh, that at one point. The one other piece that I failed to mention about the D increased $600 uh, uninsur uh, unemployment insurance benefit, that will count as income as UI typically does, but it will not be used for calculating eligibility for Medicaid or CHIP. With that, thank you, and I, I will hang around for any additional questions um, uh, that come along. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate. Thank you, um, Damian. Before I turn over to the commissioner, is there any other highlights based upon what we've been working on that you would like to call our attention to, for, based on your recent understanding of this of the CARES Act? Uh, no, I think uh, Chris hit all of the highlights. Um, there, there's kind of a detailed set of bullet points in um, the outline I sent you. Um, Thank you for the, it. It's terrific. You're very welcome. Um, if if Chris hasn't sent it over already, I can send uh, the link to the Senate Finance Committee, um, who prepared an outline of the UI and small business tax provisions. Um, which you might also find helpful. I think it's a it's a really good plain language outline um, that the committee might find helpful, but I don't think he left anything out that I would have added. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, are you are you on the line? Yes, sir, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so you want to give us uh, any more of an overview? I, I, uh, I'm anxious to hear um, if there is any advice at this point as to 
how businesses might want to proceed, small businesses, in terms of uh, the Hobson choice of layoffs versus furloughs versus um, keeping people on. Uh, I know it's going to take us a while to understand it all, but maybe you could start the process of educating us. Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, for the record, Michael Harrington, uh, Interim Commissioner of Vermont Department of Labor. Um, the other piece I wanted to, to point out um, that uh, Mr. Saunders mentioned, um, and, and I think it's something the committee should just be very, uh, pay very close uh, attention to, is that uh, as the federal government looks to provide these additional benefits, um, the, the big concerns here at the department are how do we administer these? Many uh, uh, states across the country have 30-year-old systems that are hard-coded, uh, and so the ability to essentially just add another benefit and begin to distribute that becomes much, much harder. So we're, we're going to have our uh, hands full going forward with that. Um, the other piece is that it provides a benefit on top of a benefit that comes out of our trust fund. Uh, and so far, there I don't believe there's a mechanism in there to uh, reimburse our trust fund uh, other than um, the $600 additional federal benefit that would come from the department. And so uh, I know we've talked a lot in the past about uh, potential federal relief that would reimburse our trust fund. Uh, right now, as it stands, it looks like we will be paying a benefit out of our trust fund dollars and then a federal benefit on top of that. Uh, so just please be aware of that. Um, you know that that again does not leave us with a mechanism to maintain our trust fund uh, for very long. Uh, we have testified in the past that the trust fund is very healthy. Uh, however, that was uh, about two weeks ago, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, so I think it's important for us uh, to point out. Um, essentially what, what the long-term look of our trust fund actually is. Uh, we are one of, if not the healthiest trust funds in the state prior to, uh, uh, or in the country prior to March uh, 13th. Um, but right now, I think it's going to be a question of which states have to borrow the least from the federal government. Um, and so if we were to look at, uh, I'll pick a random number, but if we ended up at 20% unemployment with all things being equal, uh, we would be looking at uh, enough money in our trust fund to last us about 19 weeks. Uh, so as we look out, you know, three or four months, um, we we are probably looking at a borrow situation unless there's additional federal monies that help reimburse uh, or or refill the coffers, if you will, of the trust fund. Can I ask you? Um, can I interrupt? Yes, sir. Because I was I was con concerned by were you suggesting that the either the money for the self-employed or the six hundred dollars extra on top of people's benefits was not going to be fully federally funded? No, those will be fully federally funded. So what I'm just trying to make a point of is that uh, someone may be eligible for state benefits out of our trust fund, and then these federal benefits are on top of that. Um, so they will be they will be earning they could be earning uh, in some cases the maximum uh, weekly benefit amount of five hundred and thirteen dollars and additional federal benefits on top of that. And I, I point that out to just show a comparison in the past where we've had uh, disaster unemployment assistance where money actually came to the state uh, to protect the trust fund. Uh, and in this case, um, that doesn't seem to be the case. And so uh, just I wanted you to be aware that the as it stands right now, there will be no federal money um, coming to the department for uh, for actual trust fund reimbursement of benefits paid out. Gotcha. And how about administrative costs? Do you feel like the law, as far as you can tell, is going to give adequate backup support for more staff and more processing? I know you say you have an antiquated uh, computer system, uh, which I thought we were fixing for the last five or six years. Um, yeah, me too. 
how, how does that and look? I just want to clear. Yeah, I just want to clarify. So you're talking about administrative dollars coming to the state to administer these programs, correct? Right. And I thought the, I thought the like phase two or something put some more money in. And I don't know about this bill, whether it had some more money for administrative costs. Uh, so uh, thank you. I appreciate the question. So we did receive some preliminary emergency administrative grants uh, from the federal government. Um, I'll give you an example, though. Vermont, uh, of the of the uh, 500 million that is out in allotment number one, of that 500 million, uh, Vermont will receive uh, approximately 918 thousand. Uh, from that. Uh, so again, um, you know, it, it seems like a lot of money, but when it comes to the state, um, it's it's uh, based on the size of the state uh, and and what each state is dealing with. For example, if you look at California, they received uh, looks like 50, 59 million uh, in this allotment, where we were just shy of a million. We do not yet know uh, what the CARES Act will um, will provide us in administrative dollars. We know, I think we can, uh, through the act, look at what the entire pot of money is for the entire country for UI administration, um, but they have not given us the formula yet um, so that each state can determine what their benefit is going to be for administrative dollars. So may I just clarify that, uh, Michael, the 918,000 to Vermont DOL is for the ramped up administration needs or for what is that for to, to help you with your ramped up administration over uh, overlay i mean additional costs yeah so uh, you are correct senator this is for the ramp up or initial administrative um funds that were announced just earlier this week outside of of the cares act that we're talking about in this case it was just supplemental funding to help states deal with um, this immediate influx uh, that we saw last last week and into this week. And may I just ask another question on the administration? So as these funds come in to pay for self-employed uh, and independent contractors, will that will you be managing those funds separately from the UI trust fund or are you going to run them through the UI trust fund so that it makes it simpler for you to roll them out? At this point, I think it's unclear, but anything we can do to uh, not muddy the waters would be our preference. Um, for instance, in the past, when we've used disaster unemployment assistance programs, those those programs um, were run 100% manually, uh, paper, uh, and that was because our UI system could not handle uh, the, that, um, you know, through the mainframe. And so it's likely that in this case, too, we will be doing a lot of the same. You're, you're kidding. Our UI system couldn't now absorb that 12 years later? Correct. It is the exact. It is the exact same UI system we had 12 years ago. It's the exact same system we've had for the past 30 years. That that's just unbelievable to me. What? 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 What is the eight? Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, so, so yeah. Go ahead, sir. Well, I I think the surprise is that we sort of remember when we were dealing with um, uh, the paid leave proposals from a few years ago, um, we were told that uh, there was a lot of administrative complexities in, in terms of the hardware and the IT, because we were in with another state out Midwest developing our computer system and any changes we wanted to make to the development of that computer system would upset the apple cart. Right. But uh, I think Senator Clarkson's question would be similar to one I had. We, I guess we had assumed that by now that development of the, the, arc, the arcane 
computer system from 30 years ago would have been uh, completed by now? Is it still a work in progress? Uh, so uh, we have testified on this in um, in House and and Senate um, to some extent, but uh, we were in a consortium. If you remember, it started about four or five years ago. Now um, we had one one state that backed out of that consortium. We brought on another state. Um, as of uh, the end of 2019. Uh, we felt that, well, one, we had reached the end of our federal funding for the program, uh, and uh, the state we were working with, the state that was doing the bulk of the development, was saying we were still a year and a half away um, from deployment. Uh, and so at this point, um, those efforts have halted. Uh, it was 100% uh, federally funded. Um, but uh, we reached the point where we were going to have to start uh, using state dollars um, to to cover the work. And so we halted that work because we we had lost faith that um, the state that was doing the development could provide a solution. To give you an, ex uh, an example, though, um, the U.S. Uh, federal government only funds right now consortium work for modernization. There have been dozens of consortiums over the past uh, eight to 10 years, uh, only one of those has been successful. Uh, and that runs a price tag of about $40 million. And right now um, are, they're on a trajectory of onboarding states every, uh, you know, launching new, new state programs about every uh, two to four years. Um, so, you know, we're looking right now, I can tell you that the, the money we got from USDOL only covered a fraction of what uh, going with a vendor solution would be, um, but that may be the only solution at this point. Okay. Do you have any um, ballpark figure as to what the caseload, even using your 20% example, might be for people getting benefits versus the size of the population who would be getting benefits under the self-employed independent contractor provisions of the uh, federal law? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the comparison. I can tell you that um, because, uh, because there's not a clear mechanism to identify um, those self-employed individuals in their entirety, um, the numbers that are traditionally used in the industry for Vermont are roughly between 30 and 60,000 individuals um, who are, are self-employed. And so we can assume that not all of those will collect benefits and they may not all collect benefits for the full time, um, but it could be as few as 30,000 or as many as 60,000. Um, when you talk about load, um, because we were able to share these numbers today um, based on um, the federal number, uh, the federal number releasing their numbers, if we're looking at the week of March 15th through March 21st, so last week, um, on a traditional week, we uh, take in about 650 claims or for the week prior, I should say. So March 8th uh, through the 14th, we took in 650 claims roughly. Uh, last week, uh, we took in approximately 14,000 claims. Yes, it's reported in Digger. I read it to Michael this morning that you I thought it was 3,667 30, 3, claims. Dicker had a piece on it this morning. Yeah, so um, there's there's two pieces and we've been trying to explain that to the media um, and many of them have called for clarification. Um, VT Digger was not one of them. So we have to file those claims that were actually uh, processed in our claim system at the end of that week. And so we were actually able uh, to process, I think our actual number that we reported to the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, from our end was 3,784 initial claims. Um, but if you remember, um, there was this huge influx. So the number of claim, uh, initial claims actually received by the department was 14,000. Wow. Wow. Did, did, uh, yeah, we, you thought, we thought the 3,600 was a lot. <laughs> a lot. 
Commissioner, do you have an understanding of um, at this point of how a what a self-employed individual would have to do to qualify for the benefit plus the six hundred dollars? I do not at this time. Um, we're still we're still going through the CARES Act uh, to see if it articulates it. But typically, what we end up finding is that 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 level of granular detail and guidance comes out um, through the U.S. Department of Labor after the bill uh, is enacted. I mean, uh, I'm assuming that a self-employed individual could not just get this money. They'd have to claim that they're they have no business anymore. Would that be a fair assumption or could they just claim it by virtue of their income in the past maybe has, I mean, if their income, if they're sustaining their income, I assume they're not qualified for this benefit. Just like a person who's continues to be employed is no longer qualified for the, for the is not qualified for unemployment benefits. You mean you have to, yeah. right? you have to be unemployed. Go ahead. No, yeah. I mean, I just, to clarify Michael's question, Michael, you're saying that you, an individual has to have made a formal claim in order to re receive this $600, right? Is that not, only, not only make a formal claim, but somehow prove that they've lost their income. If they're an unessential worker, wouldn't that um, be proof if their business was closed because they're deemed unessential? I assume so, but uh, there could be I, there could be independent practices out there in that whole code thing we saw. Like contractors are working. It's all very complicated. Um, so I guess we'll have to wait for uh, instruction. Um, I would like to move on to the question, Commissioner, that I wrote you about uh, this morning, and I copied the committee on. Could you walk us through for a small business owner, you know, what they're, they're, they're being hit hard right now. Maybe they're entirely closing down their business or partially closing down their business. Do they have some choices as to whether they can somehow maintain payroll and what that does in terms of unemployment benefits, whether they sort of suggest a return date or they um, keep people on full payroll or they do a traditional layoff what are their options and how does it how does it interplay with this new law uh yes thank you so certainly if the employer has the ability to continue to pay their workforce um you know we would encourage that but uh again um I, there are a couple different factors in terms of making people eligible for benefits. So um, if we're talking about the, the federal law, I think that remains to be seen um, to what level, like you said, what level of validation they would have to provide or articulation. Um, but if they are, uh, you know, these people are laid off uh, or I think you also mentioned furloughed, uh, we don't really contemplate the difference. I think they're, they're, the same under our our system, um, they're a temporary temporarily displaced, if you will. So um, from from that position, uh, it it looks like anybody whose whose work and wages are impacted will be covered um, under this federal program. Uh, certainly, you know the benefit of remaining employed. Um, the benefit to the employer is that they don't risk the the possibility of their of not getting that workforce back once they reopen so uh you know these individuals may end up finding a, other work um so again the benefit to the employer is that they're able to retain the workforce that they have um but the benefit to the employee could be the difference in what the overall benefit is um, so if they are earning more being employed uh, than they would on benefits, you know, the added value uh, is in the is is in the income to that for them. 
and um, we've gotten. A, I got a. I've gotten a couple of questions. I don't know if there's a standard, commonplace way this is treated, but people were asking questions about health insurance. If if they um, if they lay somebody off, uh, how would that impact ongoing health insurance? I mean, I. Um, I know there's, a pro I forget the name of the program, that COBRA uh, is something that can keep them going, but is that something you've been hearing about? So uh, we have had a lot of questions about uh, health benefits. Um, it's uh, something that we are not, um, uh, if you will, preventing people from doing or having it negatively impact their UI benefits. Uh, some employers have asked if they are able to continue to pay health care benefits for their employees, which we uh, support fully. Um, but like you said, there are alternative programs as well, like COBRA and others. Um, so it ranges both, but essentially if it's really at the employer's discretion uh, if they want to maintain benefits for their employees. I can, sorry, everyone, this is uh, Jess Benchner. I can add to what the commissioner just said. I do know that Blue Cross and Blue Shield, which we've been reporting to um, employers that they have open enrollment. They've opened a special enrollment period for the next 30 days. Um, right. So individuals who are separated from employment are able to access Vermont Health Connect in an open enrollment period. Um, they are, um, additionally, Vermont Health Connect is um, delaying and not canceling policies for, um, for, for individuals who are not able to pay. So if you do receive benefit but find that the premium is too much and you aren't able to make your payment, your benefit will not be canceled. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thanks. That's been very helpful. And I spoke with a navigator who who says that uh, there it hasn't been marketed particularly well, and so people don't know about it. But even so, she uh, she learned about it the open enrollment from me asking her, and uh, she said. But now a couple of days later, she's getting flooded <laughs> with requests. Yeah, they do have something on their website, but I have not seen any kind of like mass um, communication about it. No, um, there hadn't been. Yeah, yep. Um, I don't know if uh, you or Chris can answer this question. Is the $600 bump that the feds are going to pay for, um, is that available uh, across the board for whatever amount of unemployment insurance you get so let's assume you you get partially laid off and you get a hundred dollar weekly check are you still entitled to the six hundred dollars or do you have to be fully unemployed do we lose people here uh, no the commissioner harrington here i was waiting to see if uh Chris wanted to answer. Uh, he's probably more uh, more apt at this. We're not um, that deep into it yet. So uh, it sounds like it will be across the board um, that there will not be eligibility restrictions, if you will, based on earnings and so forth. So, but I'll leave it to Chris if he's still on the line to answer. That's my understanding as, as well. Okay. Yeah, this is Damian weighing in here. That's the way the language reads in the uh, in the actual CARES Act. It says the amount determined under state law uh, plus an additional six hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. Um, I know I have. Do other people have questions? I know. Um, I have others. I'm trying to articulate them in terms of the choices that business owners uh, would have here. Um, Michael, we had talked about uh, people who were getting some UI, but having their employer kind of backfill so that their wages main, were maintained. 
how would that be affected by the, the uh, CARES Act? Well, I, I could let uh, the commissioner and Chris answer that, but I think there's going to be less of a need to do that because um, I think that I think, the $600 is shifted. $600, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, part of the, as I understand it, part of this, the, the calculation of the $600 was to designed in part to sort of make the average uh, wage earner pretty close to whole. Um, obviously, there are going to be people who are making more right now if they're working where they're not going to be made whole. Um, uh, I would assume, Commissioner, that is it dollar for dollar if an employer gives? Well, no, there's the, 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 the partial income disregard. So uh, there would be um, some value for a, an employer to give money over to um, a high income wage earner uh, in terms of trying to make them whole. I didn't articulate that very well. <laughs> Commissioner, do you want to weigh in on, on that issue of what would happen if an employer wanted to give uh, some wage replacement uh, to the worker, whether it it takes them over what they were making or brings them up to what they were making? Uh, sure. Uh, it's unclear to us right now what the impact would be. Um, and, and we continue to work through this even before this bill uh, passed. And and that there are employers who want to contribute and we're doing the best we can to make sure those, um, you know, a, a supplement by the, the employer doesn't, um, uh, doesn't impact negatively on someone's eligibility. Uh, we're, we're dealing with that. Um, but again, I, it's unclear at this point what the CARES Act would allow for. Um, my, my initial interpretation would be that there wouldn't be an impact, um, that it's a straight $600. Um, but again, th that remains to be seen at this point. Okay. So, it, would have, it would have an impact on the UI portion of the payment, right? Right. It would reduce it. Again, um, it, it depends on how it's been structured. Like I said, we've had some employers ask this question uh, where they they would like to you know be able to provide an additional partial benefit to their employees on top of um, what their UI uh, payment would be in order to make the employee whole and to not lose that employee to another employer. Um, again, we're trying to these are kind of uncharted territories in traditional sense if they were still receiving remuneration, from their employer that would disqualify them either in part or in whole. Um, but again, recognizing that this is a very unique situation we're in. So if there are ways to work around that, we're really trying to work with the employers to do that. Um, I guess a general question that I, I would think we were all interested in is what should our constituents do? First, right. First, first the in the claimant category, and then the employer category. If they have questions, I mean, I've gotten at least a dozen questions like someone saying, here's my individual circumstances. Do you think I'm eligible? Um, do you have general advice for us and for them at this point as to what, I know your lines must be very busy and is there, I've been sort of, saying you know the first step is i might you might want to fill out the on, online claim then you'll get your answer and even if you're denied um, i guess no harm done but uh um I, I i it'd be good for us as legislators to hear what your advice to the public would be Sure. The, I think you're right on the mark there. You know, the, the most important thing should be 
if someone is impacted by this, they lose their job, whether permanently or temporarily, or if they have to leave their job uh, under the right circumstances um, that would make them eligible, the first thing they should do is file a claim. What I'd hate for them to do is um, try to call general assistance uh, and not be able to get through and delay the um, the filing of their or opening of their claim. So they should do that first. Um, we do have some information online. We do receive emails uh, across the department on a regular basis. We receive them through social media. If they really want the the information that is specific to their circumstance, the best thing they can do is call our call center. And that way someone can someone knowledgeable in the system and in the program can walk them through what their eligibility would be. Um, but you're right. The first thing they should do is is call that claims line. We do have, you know, frequently asked questions online. We try to update those and provide guidance as available to us. Um, I think the, the media has done a good job of it of keeping this uh, on the forefront each and every day uh, as things have changed. But um, you know, each each case and each person's situation is different, and uh, the best way for them to get the, the complete information is to call our claim center. And that's true for the employer, the employer line as well as the employees line. Correct. Uh, again, you know, we can speak in generalities, but um, each employer situation is going to be different as well. Um, right. We do get. Uh, uh, we do get a lot of questions on a, on a variety of means, um, but the best thing to do is in, is call our employer lines as well. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Does anyone have additional questions at this point for the commissioner? Uh, I guess I, I'd just like to, because I, I have a business call tonight with four chambers in the Windsor County area. And this is our third call. And uh, it, they've been really useful for exactly that kind of question and answer. And with this federal overlay um, and expectation, it, the $600 and the self-employment and independent contractors will all be funneled in some fashion through the Department of Labor. Is that right? And then is that right, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And then the the direct assistance will come from IRS directly to the individual. So that will, no one has to do anything about that. That is my understanding, yes. So that will be like sort of manna from heaven arriving in the in the post box or in your direct deposit. That, right? That's the way I understand it as well. Okay. Thanks. But I, everything, yeah. The only other thing I was going to add, because um, it would probably help uh, your constituents as well, is that uh, beginning next week, we're going to be looking to offer some regularly scheduled town hall meetings, uh, both for employers, um, small business owners. Eventually, we'll do one on uh, self employed individuals. We'll probably do one on um, healthcare benefits and, and paid leave and uh, maybe even claimants as well. But uh, we're gonna post those on our website. There'll be a couple a week that we do um, with days and times to be determined, but it'll be a way for uh, an employer to simply dial in and listen to uh, what we can share on individual topics, uh, probably for a half hour, 45 minutes. Those those will be fabulous. And just given our response here in Windsor County with these four chambers, you know, I don't know how many we have ranged from 300 to 600 people on a call. The, the it, just being able to hear it and then ask questions has been incredibly helpful. So I I applaud you for doing that. It's great. They really people really need need that town hall ex, uh, opportunity. Great. Thank you. I, I echo that. Uh, it's very confusing at this point, and you've clarified it quite a bit. And I think the public is very confused at that point. But I mean, it's only, you know, the bill has only been publicly known of the details as of last night. So things are moving 
very fast at this point. Um, anything else uh, you or Chris think that we should know about that we haven't covered? This has taken less time than I thought, um, but I guess we'll get more details in the days ahead. Uh, and also in, in that question, is there anything that you would like to see from the legislature other than to stay out of out of your way? <laughs> and to pay for the computer upgrade. I mean, I can't believe we're still in the, where we are with the recession. I just can't believe that. Oh, neither, neither can I. So we'll uh, we'll work on a solution together. Yeah, that's that, my guess is that may be the biggest thing you want right now. It definitely it definitely would make our life our life easier for sure. I'm sorry. Hi all. This is this is Jess Vintner. Um, I did just want to let you and anyone on the phone or in the committee know that I have been fielding um, questions for the commissioner and the team at Labor because their inboxes are extremely inundated. So please keep using me as a resource for constituent questions if they're urgent, or even if they're not urgent, but you just need to get, you know, you need at least someone to respond within an hour or two. Um, I yeah. can be that resource for you all. And Jess, I, we appreciate that. Uh, I had let Jess know, and I will let, just let remind the committee, because we all felt the same way, I think, that um, Secretary Curley was terrific on the call last night with us on joint rules. and. It, she was very helpful in clearing up some, some questions we all had. And uh, we really appreciated her, her calm and her humor and uh, her willingness to, uh, to interpret broadly some of, some of the direction from on high. Is the, uh, the call that, I, in, during that call, she suggested we, email Kendall yes. uh, with employer questions of whether they would be deemed essential or not. Is that still the preferable way to go? You can definitely do that. Um, Kendall forwards all of those to me. Yeah, <laughs> so I was say, I you can definitely copy. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely copy in Kendall for awareness. If I do respond to you, I would copy in Kendall anyway. So you can copy the both of us. Right. I really want to thank you because I mean you have been incredibly responsive. I've been trying to screen as many as I can to send to you, but the ones I've sent to you, uh, you've responded quickly and with uh, thorough answers. So I appreciate that. Let me uh, interject something, Michael, if I may. Absolutely. That that's related to the process of uh, providing answers to the letters for exception to the. Uh, uh, closing rules. In other words, companies who believe that they should be exempt because they fit the categories in ACCD's message. And I know that we're talking about ACCD here rather than labor, but these two kind of get conflated to an extent. And from what I'm seeing from at least two constituent companies uh, up here, that process isn't working. The applications aren't being answered, nor is correspondence to the department being answered. I have one company, for example, that laid off 45 people yesterday because they couldn't get an answer as to whether or not they qualified for an exemption. Now, we heard from Secretary Curley yesterday that companies that fit the yes answers on the list that they provided, for example, doing national defense work and, uh, and so on in manufacturing uh, would be exempt. But I had one company who said, well, the rules say that I've got to get an answer uh, to this exception letter and I didn't get an answer and I can't get anybody to respond to me. And what I found in ACCD, I can't get anybody to respond to me either. So I, I and this is not the only company, I had another large company that elected to go ahead and continue, but they've not gotten an answer yet either. So I do believe that we have a problem that we need to recognize. Um, can I speak up? It's uh, Commissioner Goldstein. Um, understand the, uh, the frustration. We, um, First, we, we want to make clear that there is no such thing as exception letters. Um, we are sending out guidance as we speak to people who came in to us, and we've collected their 
emails and, and contact information. As you can imagine, the, the response to the executive order have been in the thousands. Um, so what we are doing instead is sending out sector guidance that is happening even as I speak. It started last night. Um, it, so our advice is that people should look at the executive order, the CISA list, uh, to see if they fit into that category. We want businesses to make that determination based on the executive order, not where we're going to say, yes, you're, you're good, you're not good. Um, Don't you require them to submit an application? Uh, what we required was, what we asked for was for them to fill out a form so that we could collect the information so we knew what we were dealing with in terms of numbers and sectors and who's impacted and what are the questions. And that helped us formulate the guidance. Well, and the, it's, both companies that have contacted me indicated that they expected a response to the application form and were concerned that they got no response. Understood. I mean, we are getting people saying that and we're trying as much as possible to get out the list saying, you know, please do not wait for a response from us to determine whether or not you are within the confines of the executive order. Well, when, when you do that, are you contacting the companies telling them not to wait or do you have something published telling them not to wait? Yes. Yeah, so what we did is we answered all emails that came into the either the COVID email box that we had separately set up. We also wrote to everybody on the distribution list for all the forms that got sent in. It pre-filled a spreadsheet with everyone's contact information. But it might just be where we've crossed paths. This started last night because of the volume. Um, it started last night and it went into today. We're still we are still in the process of getting that information out. Uh, in the meantime, anybody who does come in, we are sending them a letter to say, do not expect a, uh, I can read out the exact um, verbiage, but basically it's not to expect a letter from us saying yes or no. It's really about following the guidance. The calls were overwhelming. Uh, we were getting 70 calls a second. You know, it was just, you could not well, possibly answer it quick enough. That. I could understand the volume and, and the pressure that everybody is working under. But in, in my, from what I've seen, the guidance is and it's unclear. And as an example of, you know, you, you may have sent things out, but I got one company, 25 this afternoon has just sent me a note, just to let you know, we have still, still received no reply from the Commerce Department on our application to stay open. Uh, if the guidance had said something to the effect, and, and maybe still can, that you, should not expect an answer to us this that uh, in the event that you fit the guidelines as we have distributed it you you may stay open if that's if that's if that's your position but it's just not clear to people hello joan Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Oh. Um, yeah, understood. I mean, we are we are pivoting, uh, changing messaging on voicemail. I mean, they're bound to be people disappointed, and uh, we're we're working through it. So, Joan, this is Becca. Oops, we just lost you, Becca. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, I hear yeah. you. Now see okay. You. Um, Go ahead, Becca. How how best can we help get the word out? It seems like you're all working as hard as you possibly can with the number of phone lines that you have. What can we do as senators to get the word out in the best way to the people that need this information? I think they should go to the ACCD website and I think they should read the executive order. And if they do not fit within those confines and if they have doubt, they should err on the side of public health. That is our guidance. Okay, thank people, you. People do not like the message. I think they don't want to close. I think that's most of the pushback. I mean, the, the injury is enormous. It's enormous. Uh, yeah, I just want to speak to 
folks who were not on the ACCD call with joint rules last night, I just want to speak on behalf of the, the agency. I know that everyone at the agency who has an eye on the commerce end of the agency feels completely heartbroken at the situation that's happening with companies right now. And I just, I know that we're all feeling so much pressure and anxiety from our businesses. And I just, I know if they could work any harder, they would. And I just, I want us all to hold that. And uh, may I just echo what Becca said? I thought actually one of the moving things that Lindsay said uh, yesterday was that, you know, this is precise. We are, we are asking people to do everything that we don't want them to do. You know, we want them to be in business. We want them to grow. And here we are having to ask them to do things we would never in a month of Sundays be asking them to do. And Besides, Becca, that, that feeling, you know, you could just feel with her the, you know, the, you know, that Joan and, and Lindsay are asking our, our business community to do everything that they're wired not to do. And I, I so appreciated Lindsay's co conflict and sharing that very honestly with us. I thought that was, that was, <laughs> that articulated the problem right there. Look, the, I, I'm in no means, by no means, criticizing Lindsay's message, uh, the importance of it, and what she said. She said the right things. What the agency wants to do are the right things. What I'm suggesting, though, is there needs to be clarity. Mm -hmm. These problems would not exist. Uh, the message that was distributed on ACC's website had sufficient clarity so that people knew what they were supposed to do. What Lindsay tells us as a group of senators is one thing. We understand it, but it needs to be transmitted directly from ACCD to the people who should be reading that message. Yes, and we are doing that. We are doing that. I, do, I you know, it's first and foremost, they, they do not need certification or approval from us. And people did, you know, misconstrue that. Other people got it right away. They knew that the message was a, was a tough one, but they knew that they had to stop construction, like just as an example, you know? So we are asking them to use the guidance to make a determination of whether they may continue in-person operations under the governor's executive order. And we ask them to please go through it. Uh, and then there are other people who have federal um, determinations through the critical infrastructure workers. Um, um, I'm sorry, it's called the CISA document. It's federal guidance. Um, they look at that and they have to make that determination. We cannot tell them. I mean, that's what a lot of people are waiting for and they shouldn't. Right. They need to make that determination and it's a tough one. And yes, it was slower than we expected. We definitely set up a bad expectation that we would have been able to get to everybody and we would have been able to do it more timely, but it was, it's just overwhelming. Before we wrap up, I had a question back up, back to the, um, the $377 billion for business owners and nonprofits. Um, so if I understand it correctly, we don't know at this point whether somebody could get um, those loans regardless of whether they keep people on payroll. Is that my understanding? Correct. You mean for, for the federal, you mean the federal programs that are being implemented as a result of this bill from last night? Yeah, I think uh, Commissioner Harrington and Chris talked about it, and I think they said they did not know. I mean, I, I it seems to me that there's, there's got to be some connection, otherwise somebody who's likely to shut down would uh, shut down, let their workers get unemployment, and then they would continue to go in and get some loans and grants. Uh, and it would be financially foolhardy to, to go ahead and not let my employees 
get unemployment, pay that knowing that I'm going to be reimbursed. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree with your conclusion. Um, in fact, the businesses that we spoke to, um, many of them just laid people off and do not have the cash flow, will not have the cash flow to pay. Right. Could somebody, um, what I read briefly, could somebody, uh, I guess it would be commissioner, can you talk just a little bit about uh, reimbursable employers? Uh, my understanding is that the feds are going to pay, 50, reimburse them for 50% of what they pay out to the people they lay off. Uh, I'm, I'm not prepared to speak to that at the moment. I don't have that information in front of me. Um, and I will confirm with uh, Cameron Wood, our director uh, and our general counsel. Um, and maybe Chris Saunders uh, could speak to that based on his knowledge of the bill. So that's, that's the nonprofits and uh, municipal? Yeah, I think, and maybe Damien, yes, if Damien's still on the call, maybe he can talk to it. He could be the only person, well, I won't say the only person, <laughs> but I was amazed to hear you actually read the bill, but that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, a riveting a read. Slumber party with the bill. Uh, I that, wish that was the case. Is that right? I need a bit of sleep. Uh, yeah, so the provision in there related to um, governmental entities and nonprofit organizations is there's funding in there to reimburse the nonprofits and the governmental entities for 50% of the amounts that they pay into the state unemployment trust fund. So they still have to make the payments to the state unemployment trust fund, but there will be a provision in there to get them reimbursement for 50% of what they pay in. Uh, there is also direction to the US Secretary of Labor to issue guidance to state departments of labor uh, regarding additional flexibility on the payment of uh, the reimbursable amounts and the assessment of penalties and interests. Is, um, do th those workers I assume also would be entitled to the $600? Mm -hmm. uh, those you workers that? are treated uh, just how uh, so regular private employers that grew. Oh, am I breaking up? Yeah, there you well, are. We, we didn't hear any of that really. Okay, let me try again. So uh, the, uh, the laid off workers from a nonprofit or a governmental entity are treated the exact same as a worker from a private employer in terms of the benefits they receive and their eligibility. Uh, the differences in how their benefits are paid for. With private employer, it's it's paid for upfront through the tax rate. For the nonprofit or the governmental employer uh, that elects to be a reimbursing employer, it's it paid for through reimbursement. Okay, good. Um, so, does anybody else have any questions? This has been incredibly helpful. Um, going to continue to learn as we go forward. Um, I'm very, when I hear so far, I'm very thankful to, to our congressional delegation and all the work they've done and oh, out of Washington, because this is a lifesaver. Um, the, um, we're going to move on to workers comp, unless anybody has any questions right now. Michael, I don't, I don't know if this is the time to ask, but it has to do with um, experience ratings. We had a question from adult daycares right. that are questioning what would happen if they lay people off and then going forward aren't able to rehire their whole workforce. How would they be impacted? I will leave that, ask that question of the commissioner. So again, it, I think the question would be whether or not the employer uh, 
if the employer does not hire them back, um, you know, well, one, I, in most cases here, we're talking about um, tax rate forgiveness um, in, in most of these cases. So uh, they receive their benefits uh, throughout the period for the maximum amount allotted. Um, and in this, in most of these cases, there would be no negative impact to employers anyways. Um, other than that, I, I again, I, there is no, if, if the employer closes or if the employer doesn't hire certain people back, um, that doesn't really, really weigh into it, unless I'm missing the point of the question. Well, I think one of the things in the bill we passed, there was a, uh, uh, there was some time limitations of eight weeks or right expanded mm -hmm. it, is that if this goes on for longer or if the person I thought there was a requirement of uh, rehiring or restart up of well if the business doesn't start up I don't know where you're going to get the money from but uh, but yeah Yes, I understand where you're going now. Yes. So there was a provision, yes, requiring the employer to hire people back. Um, the way we assess uh, the impact of the employer is on a, a per claimant basis. Um, so when we relieve employers of charges, it's on a per claimant basis. So if they, let's say they laid off 10 people and only hired five of those people back, they would re be relieved of the charges for those five people. Okay. that they hired back good um, I, I guess the, the question is still remains um you know what um protection is there for these uh, especially things like adult day cares or even child care um uh, or businesses that aren't able because they don't have the people coming that they don't have um you know whatever how are they going to be affected and from what i'm hearing from the commissioner um, they would be um, impacted only for those people that they didn't hire back i mean i think we talked a little bit about this when we talked about seasonal businesses and the way they would be rehiring they wouldn't be able to rehire say at the end of the crisis because the business wasn't active at that point in the time uh, but how does this then translate to these other um, situations i guess we'll wait and see yeah i will say in most cases if if an employer does not reopen um you know that is a loss to the department in terms of of uh, contributions um so uh Again, if they were to open on a smaller scale than when they closed originally, um, they would be impacted proportionally for whoever they hire back or don't hire back. Thank you. So we should continue. Uh, it's a good question. And I think we need to continue to look at that, Cheryl, um, because what I'm hearing is that uh, if the we've given uh an ex exception to the chargeability for a certain time period but if it's the person is not rehiring there could be a negative impact on the employer uh so um i think we need to continue to have a dialogue uh about that and we do have some time because we've given at least a an eight week eight period there and it could be longer so, um, so I think it's an important point. Um, okay, uh, thank you all very much. And we're gonna move on to, uh, anybody have any else, any other questions, I'm sorry. No, okay. You know, that little shake of the head made you uh, come up on my screen, Allison. <laughs> yeah, I could do my jumping jacks now. We all need a seventh inning stretch. There you go, there you go. Um, okay, let's move on to workers comp. Um, I had been approached by some labor groups feeling that there was some uh, inflexibility in our statutes that may provisions that may not could not be waived. Uh, 
I'm a little um, fuzzy on how much communication there may have been uh, with the department. I think there has been some. Um, so maybe we can start off with uh, Steve Monahan uh, to tell us whether or not uh, they feel they have the necessary flexibility in law or whether they need some more or want some more in terms of uh, workers comp claimants um, uh, getting a fair shake under the circumstances. Uh, good afternoon, Steve Monahan, Director of Workers Compensation and Safety at the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, I had actually had not received any communication from any groups uh, until about an hour ago, I heard from um, some claimants attorneys uh, asking that we issue a moratorium on discontinuing benefits. Um, there is some inflexibility in that statute uh, because the statute currently provides that the carrier provide the claimant and the department with seven days notice. And if we are unable to get to it within the seven days, the termination automatically takes effect. I've uh, been looking, I've been studying for more than two weeks now, uh, trying to figure out a way to lessen that harm. Uh, I've been preparing a bulletin that would require uh, prior to discontinuing based on uh, in a insurer's belief that a claimant had reached medical end result that uh, there be evidence that the medical authority reaching that opinion had consulted with the claimant's doctor at least so we would have some assurance the difficulty that claimants are experiencing and some insurers is that um, a lot of the medical care that might be provided is not currently available uh, under the current guidelines for uh, what's non-essential care. So things like PT that might be necessary um, has not been occurring. Um, we've had, we've encouraged people to utilize telemedicine. That would, there are ways to do some of this uh, that way. It is uh, acceptable Steve, under our medical Steve, fee schedule. Steve, can I back up for a second? Um, sure. I, I'm not a hundred percent sure that the all members of the committee are familiar with the workers' comp system, and I don't want a, a big tutorial, but can you just lay a framework a little bit about how you get to a, this discontinuance uh, point in time uh, so people could understand what's clearly what's happening here? Um, sure. In, in short, I think people have the basic understanding if you get hurt at work, an injury arises out of and in the course of employment, you get workers' compensation. Initially, the claimant has to prove that they have an injury and that it occurred at work or was related to work. Um, once you start receiving benefits, the, the burden of discontinuing those benefits shifts to the insurance company, but benefits can be stopped if you return to work they, full time, they can be stopped if you reach medical end result, which means this is as good as you're going to get, or they can be stopped because you refuse to cooperate with treatment or other requirements like looking for work. We, uh, one of the things that I'm proposing is that we uh, not permit discontinuance based on looking for work for the short term because uh, that might very well be futile. And there's Vermont Supreme Court case law, rather old, but case law that supports that determination in some cases. So in a nutshell, the insurance company seeks to discontinue. Usually it's because they believe either the claimant isn't complying with the rules or has reached medical end result and they've had an independent medical exam uh, to support that opinion. 
um, claimants then have the opportunity to bring evidence forward in their favor. But under the current situation, they're not able to do so if they can't get a hold of their doctor. I don't. I don't know if you want a much more elaborate. No, I mean everybody it's, knows it's, I could go on for days. Yeah. No. 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 It's it's shaping up to be a dilemma. <laughs> um, clearly, uh, you yeah. know, people have some rights, but because of the situation out here, um, they can't fully exercise those rights. And uh, so, what do we do about it? I mean, it it, it sounds like for it. One of the things that struck me is that the governor made an executive order or some statement that in terms of unemployment, um, the work search requirement would be suspended. Uh, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be suspended really in the case of workers' comp. And now we have a secondary issue where a worker who may want to get a metal, medical exam to question the discontinuation has an inability to get that. Um, so what is the, is the department thinking about changing anything? And you said something where you're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. The statute says you have to do this. And do you, you need a legislative fix or are there things you could do administratively to get to a, um, some more flexible result? Well, uh, it's been suggested that we have some inherent authority in the face of an emergency to issue a bulletin suspending certain rules. Um, not entirely clear that I would have that authority, but um, I was preparing a bulletin to, in some respects, uh, change the rules. I think we do have authority to suspend the operation of certain rules in an emergency. Um, and uh, that's what I was leaning towards in preparing a bulletin to go out to do. Um, in terms of the actual discontinuances, um, you know, I think staff would review, but if we added this requirement, that they uh, had to have additional evidence or have communicated with the physician or something of that effect, then the uh, ability of staff when reviewing them would be easier to reject the discontinuance. The other possibility is um, to direct that payments continued and state that we would give credit against any permanency that might ultimately be owed. Um, that would work in, the, in some cases, um, not necessarily assist where uh, the injury was minor and there wasn't a great deal of permanency. Okay. Um, maybe we can turn it over to uh, David Mickenberg, uh, who's on the list representing uh, the concerns that the claimants have and hear from him and then we'll go back to you, Steve, and anybody else who might want to comment on this. My, 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 I have a feeling that after talking with the committee, you know, the suggestion might be to, given the fact that you haven't had much communication, i uh, surprised to hear that, but uh, I'm not saying anybody's at fault here, but um, that maybe that over the next few days you consult not only with claimants, attorneys, and people like David, but also with the insurance companies and see if there's a, a compromise that can be reached. I think there's a feeling of everybody's in this together that maybe we can find a solution that works. But let's hear from David at this point. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, and we can see you. Yes, happy to be here. Um, so I'm a, I appreciate, um, I know that some of our practitioners have sent uh, notes to Steve over the days. I'm sorry he hasn't received them, but we understand everyone's working under difficult circumstances. Um, uh, when it, this issue of discontinuance really uh, focuses on whether or not we put claimants in sort of harm's way or the community in harm's way, and it's not just medical end, but there's a variety of, 
Steve mentioned uh, work searches, but there's a variety of mechanisms or uh, within the rules, a variety of requirements of compliance, things like work searches, but also to um, continue medical care, um, VR work, um, IME examinations, things that would require claimants to um, be in the community, either in their medical, uh, in, in a medical office or um, to be out there looking for work, which would potentially raise the risk for themselves and the community. So uh, happy to hear that the department is thinking about that. Um, and I think it's uh, important that as we um, tell people to, to stay um, at home, we also don't put them in financial risk of losing their ongoing benefits. It's been suggested that there be a, a, a straight moratorium on Form 27s, which is the discontinuance. That's one thought, but at the very least, uh, we'd be happy to work with the department or the committee to figure out ways in which um, claimants aren't being asked to uh, be exposed to greater risk than they otherwise should be, or expose others to greater risk just to maintain their ongoing benefits. Um, it's already difficult enough because once a Form 27 is filed, you have one week of benefits and then you're, the, the default is to cut off the benefits until claimants can then produce evidence. There's a potential to get one more week um, at the discretion of the department if you present evidence, but essentially once a Form 27 is filed, that, that marks the end of your benefits until that can be adjudicated and adjudication even under normal circumstances can take quite some time. So uh, in the department's rules under rule 12, there's a list of a variety of reasons to discontinue benefits and then a catch all uh, requirement of non-compliance with any and all requirements in the statute that I think is an area that we would be happy to look at uh, with the department and the committee to make sure that claimants aren't uh, unreasonably put at risk um, or unreasonably have their benefits cut off with no ability to um, marshal the evidence to um, to demonstrate that it shouldn't be. So um, encouraged by Steve's comments, but this is something which affects thousands and thousands of workers uh, around the state um, and I think needs to be addressed in, in in short order to make sure that people one aren't exposing themselves or exposing others but also are able to maintain their benefits and i remind you besides the the state which is self-insured um, these benefits are are being provided by and large by um by insurance companies that cover these claims um, so has there been uh i was going to ask how many people are impacted by discontinuations in any week or month and have there been this is probably a question for steve has there been any specific complaint to date of a claimant who's been injured by not being able to get to the doctor and how has that been handled in the department in the last week i guess uh, I'm not sure we've had any in the last week. In the last two weeks, this is Steve Monahan again. The last two weeks, we've had a couple of complaints um, from claimants who either did not want to go to an independent medical exam um, or who were have in one case, who were having difficulty getting um, an alternative position. We had granted a two week extension. They're still in that period. We've encouraged uh, physicians to utilize telemedicine. There's no reason why independent evaluations can't be done uh, through telemedicine without having to require the claimant to travel in most instances. Um, there may be some objections. Some people like to actually see the individual, but at this time, I think a more reasonable approach would be telemedicine, both the safety of the physician and the claimant. Um, we're happy to work with some folks. Uh, we are committed to the maximum extent possible to maintain and ensure that people get the benefits they're entitled to. 
um, and my staff, even though we've been busy arranging for them to work remotely to lessen the uh, risk as well, um, we're still pretty heavily paper driven, so they're in and out collecting files. But um, my staff know that our goal is to maintain benefits uh, to the extent practicable. And as I said, we're looking at, um, it's already in the statute, that if we direct that payments continue, it can, at the request of the insurer, uh, be credited against any future indemnity owed. So I think right. there is that safety valve already yeah, built that, into that, the statute. Right, that sounds like an elegant solution in the cases where there is some permanency, but maybe doesn't work when there's not. Uh, have you talked to any of the insurance companies? We just heard on the other uh, hearing we were having that Blue Cross Blue Shield is like giving an open enrollment period and for giving premiums. Uh, is there any willingness to do that by the property and casualty groups on workers comp? I have, I have not heard of that. I know uh, we got one complaint that we referred to the Department of Financial Regulation that one insurer had decided not to renew policies of certain nursing homes, um, which would throw them into the pool in a higher rate. And um, I do have to remind people that uh, while the benefits are paid by insurers, they're, they're ultimately paid by our employers, the same people who are getting crunched on the other end um, because they'll pay through premiums. Um, right. So while initially it looked at the start of the year like uh, premiums would be going down, uh, we can't be sure what impact this is going to have uh, on the collection of those premiums if the payrolls drop. Okay. So that may result in a, in a dramatic increase in premiums um, next year if uh, there's been a dramatic decrease in payroll and, an in, and a correspondent increase in um, claims or claim payments. But okay. there are Do many you, um, moving pieces. Yep. So if we, it sounds like you're amenable to working with David and others on some solution to to go forward or to bring back to us. Is there are there people that like in the next week who are going to lose their benefits as far as you know that may have a uh, an exception? I would say, I mean, we get in a normal year we get more than uh Well, you get, I was gonna, I'm trying to think it might be 750 per staff member notices to discontinue in a normal year. Um, many of them are rejected, mm -hmm. but um, I, so without, without, even though it hasn't been directly brought to my attention, I'm sure there are people whose benefits are in danger of ending. But are they people that may have complaints against their termination? I mean, are they people who can't go to an IME well, or have different? Well, there's, there's a lot of people who normally would be returning because they were going back to work and that's no longer available. So I think, I think there may be issues. They, there may actually not be a dispute that they reach medical end result, um, but it'll be a drastic change. They would if, if in fact their workers' comp ends, they do, if they uh, apply within six months, they are eligible to file for unemployment, but that's a dramatic decrease generally from what they were making in workers' so it comp. To me like, it sounds to me like you were close to making a, a decision, at least on that reason for termination of putting those in abeyance. I mean, just like we're doing with all the uh, Yes. Uh, I think looking at, okay. as I said, some very old uh, cases from the Vermont Supreme Court dating back to the 20s as support for that. But um, I am looking at, at that. I'm happy to work with uh, claimants, attorneys, and insurers 
to come up with uh, some kind of a solution. Okay. Um, well, I would I'm hope happy to convene the workers comp, uh, the bar association, the workers comp group. Right. Um, well, I would hope that speaking for myself, I would hope that you would do that in short order and come back to us next week and give us a, a report. Uh, but I also am concerned for people right now who are being terminated because they can't go out and seek another job or there's no job to be had or whatever, uh, that at least that policy could uh, be put in abeyance for, for a short time by simply um, a guideline change or a directive to your uh, claims examiners to say, uh, let's hold off on those until we sort this out. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or thoughts on this? We'll schedule it again for next week and see what the proposals come back with. Mr. Chair, can I just raise one other issue after the... Yep. Um, one issue just to think about, and there's obviously phases of what's going on related to workers' comp and every other issue we're dealing with now. Uh, one other issue is, um, and this has come up around the country in other civil litigation contexts, but workers' comp would be no different, is around um, the potential for, and this would probably need to be a statutory fix around tolling the statute of limitations um, in terms of um, making claims. Uh, you have a three-year statute of limitations to file a claim, but also um, within that time, uh, there's a six years to make, once a claim has been filed, to make a claim for certain benefits. And in some instances, some people uh, during this time uh, may not be aware of their right to make a claim for certain benefits um, and therefore may lose their uh, right to make that claim. So it's not something uh, maybe urgently uh, to look at, but I wanted to put it on your radar. Um, as something which is popping up around the country in, in discussion of pra with practitioners. Um, so we're, we're the general rule that we're operating on, at least in these next few weeks, is only to deal with bills that are directly related and, and uh, urgently needed by the, um, related to the, uh, the COVID-19 situation um, right right uh, so i i don't know that we might get to something like that later on and i don't know that people who are unaware of their rights are necessarily made unaware of their rights because of the virus they could still file those claims remotely or talk to their lawyer right. so i don't see it as a, a pressing need but uh we perhaps could talk yeah. about it some more Next week. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't see that as, this is Steve Monaghan, see that as a pressing need. I think, um, one, Vermont's three year and six years is um, we a lot more time than, than people have in most states. Um, and I don't think, I don't really see it as an issue uh, based on my entirely optimistic belief that this is more of a short term as in, <laughs> Uh, maybe through August or by by the end of the year issue and not one that will um, prompt. I think certainly think if it starts to look like it's becoming an issue, um, we can consider consider it later. Um, but it doesn't seem like an issue to me at this point. Um, and I think most uh, I think the saturation has been pretty good as to what people understand their rights are out there based on the frequent communications we receive at the department. Okay. Thank you both very much. All right. Committee, do you have any further questions? Like I say, we'll take it up again next week. Hope the parties can work it out. Okay. Um, thank you, folks. You can sign off now. Okay. Uh, thank you. We're going to move on to uh, the issue of hoarding, or maybe not. Is Aaron C. Christ on the line now? So I wanted to discuss this with the committee. I think we talked about it a little bit. We may not need to prolong this, and we can 
get in touch with Aaron and tell her we don't need it. Uh, one idea I had, uh, I could, I've had it for a while, and I, I'm not sure I've gotten any traction with it. Um, I think there was a press release with the governor and other folks on the urging grocery stores and to have senior hours in the morning and stuff. And I think Aaron wrote me at that time saying there might be something forthcoming on the hoarding issue. I don't like to use that word, but the way I define uh, the, the, the solution that I would see that I suggested to her and Jim Harrison at one point was just, why don't the grocery stores put limits on precious items that uh, to say at the checkout counter, just, just say, uh, you know, we're, our store policy is only two 12 packs of paper towels at this point. Not, not, no law, no executive order, just say that to your customers. They have that ability to do that as a business practice. And I said, and, you know, maybe my committee or maybe the governor would support you in that. So you could point to us saying we suggested you do that. And so um, that's what I wanted to talk to her about. I don't know if people feel it's an issue or we should be concerned about it. We could do a resolution if we wanted to. Just so some you, stores are already doing it. Uh, right. Hannah, for example, uh, in St. Albans, uh, in their paper towel aisle, limits the number of rolls of paper towels that you can buy to two at a time. Okay. So, so yeah. So the, so the question is, do does the committee feel like we do need to do any more? Or is it widespread? Would the grocers appreciate us making a suggestion like that? I, I don't think it's. Some states have passed laws. Some some states have um, have had executive orders. I don't think we need to go that far. I just wanted to give the grocery store some mm -hmm. backup. Say the mm -hmm. public policy officials want us to do this, so I'm doing it in part because of them. I wish they, like you say, some of them are just doing it on their own. But again, we're all in this together. Well, I don't know if we need to beat this horse anymore. Just let it go, or what? Would it help if Aaron is Aaron on the line? It doesn't. He's going to be on the line at. 345 but ah, we could wait. because I think if if she was able if Aaron was able to send out a letter to all the retailers uh, from both the governor the legislature and that organization uh, asking them to please put limits on the products that are you yes. know if, if, so if, that's, yeah, that's, that's all that's needed that's right and that's all I asked her to do and she came back and said she was concerned for antitrust that a trade association shouldn't be telling their members to do that. Well, then I'm maybe just from the legislature and the governor. That's what I, that's what I was thinking that yeah. we could, if we maybe even just our committee, we could just send her a letter and say, yeah. and I say, can you share this letter with your members? I, I, think, her, I think that would be great. I think that's a good idea. I think it would be helpful to have, for her to have something to send out to all of them to give them, I mean, to really ask them to to limit the products that uh, that the public seem to find beyond precious. I, I think the governor has already spoken to this several times in the press conferences. Yeah. Um, but I know that the problem we're running into here is that most of the grocery stores and small stores are putting limits on, but Walmart isn't. And that's a place I'd like to see some, um, direction or some requests for them to start limiting. Um, it's, it's pretty apparent in the role. So I, I wanted to talk about this now because I wanted to give you guys some more time off the phone. I know Becca has to leave soon. So Denise or Faith, can you see if you can connect with uh, Erin and get her on now as opposed to waiting another 10 minutes? Well, well yeah. while we're waiting, can we ask Becca a question? Sure. Uh, joint rules is the tax commissioner this afternoon. Who's on? We joint haven't, I haven't received an update yet. I know we were trying to get Craig Bolio on the line, but I was just checking email. I haven't received a confirmation of that yet. I know Tim's been flat out. So, um, but that's who I think we're hearing from. That's what I thought. Thanks. And I have a question about the timing for the new UI. Um, regs that are going into effect. I know that, you know, the, the bill has to be finalized, but 
Are we able to tell people how much longer they're going to have to wait before they can start collecting? What, are you talking about our bill? Yeah. <laughs> I think you could tell them they should file right now. I think they're going to follow those. I, I assume the governor's signing it today uh, or did already. And I think they're all on board. I think they would process it that way as well. So I, I wouldn't wait on telling people. Senator Sorok, could we have somebody join the call? To, who has? Uh, I'm not sure who it is. Uh, you could ask them to identify themselves. Is that Aaron? It's uh, Aaron. It's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. We were just Hello, talking everyone. about you. <laughs> we're First just time. talking about you. Yes. So we had a few extra minutes, so I sort of set the stage. Uh, where is there any new developments on the issue of uh, grocery stores uh, being encouraged to set limits on products? Um, so as I shared last week, we, we are not able to encourage um, stores in a strong way to set limits um, aside from uh, stores having conversations uh, among their teams, um, I am seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, increased, uh, increased part I guess, increased action in um, setting limits. My understanding is that they've expanded the limits from outside of the, um, the paper products aisle to, to other areas within the store. Um, I've also been in touch with retailers and distributors, and at this point, uh, large grocers are sharing that anything that customers would want to hoard is not available in large quantities right now. Um, stores will start to look fuller in the next couple of weeks, and I we anticipate that um, once they start looking fuller, people will become uh, less anxious and stop buying in such large quantities. Did you send me something or somebody sent me something about a press release, I think, on store hours? Um, yes, we sent a press release out uh, late last week, encouraging all retailers uh, and grocers around the state to designate uh, hours for vulnerable Vermonters or um, provide access to curbside delivery or um, home delivery in in areas that are possible to handle that. Um, we have posted a, a link on our website with, um, I wanna say a little over 100 stores uh, that are providing either designated hours or um, curbside delivery or, de or home delivery. Um, and those stores are listed with their address, phone number, and what those store hours are or if they're providing another service. I thought in the email that I got, I don't know if it was from you or not, but that there was some reference that there, there may be something similar coming up on uh, purchase limits on quantity of certain goods. Is that something <laughs> that you said or somebody else that said it? Um, I anticipate that that was somebody else that said that. Um, I will also share with the committee that I was part of a press conference with the governor and Congressman Welch urging people to uh, rethink their purchasing habits. I urged the public to revert uh, back to how they were purchasing prior to the pandemic setting in. Um, uh, one fun note for the committee is I've received my first piece of hate mail because of that. Um, but Now you'll have uh, more empathy for us. Yes, <laughs> yes, um, but uh, we have not issued a press release urging the public to to stop hoarding, but I have, because of that press conference, I've been uh, in touch with uh, several media outlets, um, radio uh, and print, as well as TV. Um, I've done more interviews than I can count this past week on Courting as well as the supply chain. Um, I'm not sure if a press release would would get the public to to stop hoarding. Um, 
So my, but my, I, my, my question is, I, I, it's getting kind of circular here. Um, <laughs> it's my understanding that if a store owner voluntarily wanted to say to a customer, I'm only going to sell you two 12 packs of paper towels, that would be within their right to do that. It's their yes, business. That is what, yep. They could do what they want, yes. right? Correct. But it is not so within. So, so the direction that I would, the direction that I was hoping, because I, I know that other states have had executive orders and we've actually, one of the centers did some research on legal steps people have taken in crises like this in terms of product distribution. I don't want to go there. It seems kind of crazy. I just want to do it voluntarily. So I was thinking that either our committee or the Senate could pass a resolution encouraging store owners to, to impose limits, and then they could point the finger at us and say, you know, the, the Senate has spoken and told us to do this. So to the extent they're on the fence and they don't want to do it, they have a little bit more oomph behind and say the legislature suggested we do this. Is that well, something uh, that if, if for instance, well, the simplest of all things, if we were to write a letter to you, right, in the form of a, a resolution or something and say, could you distribute this on, on our behalf to your members? Is that something that would be a problem? Um, I don't foresee it being a problem. I don't know if it would make an impact. Again, retailers across the state are already imposing uh, certain limits. Um, you know, many of the small stores especially are doing the personal shopping and doing curbside delivery. So that's cut back on the hoarding. Um, frankly, it's, I think it's an effort of trying to relieve some of the anxieties in the public. And um, without, sounding like I'm asking you guys to do anything, it might be more beneficial for everyone in the General Assembly to send out a note to their, I'm assuming many of you have distribution lists that you communicate with, mm -hmm. and they would rather hear from you guys than the Retail and Grocers Association or from their retailer that they can't access the products that they want. Um, but maybe just some assurance from, from their elected officials would, would be more impactful than than a retailer wagging a finger and saying you can't have two gallons of milk or um you know i'm i'm more than happy to partner with the legislature um if you feel that i can put something together to send out to constituents but um i just feel like it would be it's the public the public is is anxious and they're doing everything they can to uh, prepare for uncertain times and retailers can only put so many limits on so many products. Okay. Well, this issue is going to be with us for a while. I don't feel like we have to make a decision right now, but I uh, no. will talk about it as a committee and we'll figure out a way to go. And I appreciate how busy you must be. It's crazy for all of us. So thanks for taking the time to call in. Does anybody else have any questions for Aaron? No, but thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate, it. and I think it, it is incumbent on us to 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 remind our constituents to please be thoughtful about their purchases. And can I just ask, Aaron, are you seeing any um, movement in the supply chain? Are you seeing any improvement? Yes, good question. So, um, in addition to fielding questions. Um, part of my efforts have also been to be in consistent, well, constant contact with members about the supply chain. I'm also giving those updates to um, ACCD and SEOC, um, and the supply chain is starting to, to catch up. It, like I shared uh, earlier, we're hoping that the stores, the large stores will look fuller in the next uh, one and a half to two weeks. Um, it's just it's taken a little longer for the supply chain to um, to again catch up, but but it's starting to it's starting to regulate. And so, and some of us, other than the paper products, have noticed absolutely no difference in any of the other products. I mean, there are plenty of vegetables. There's plenty of meat. There's 
plenty of everything in at our local max which is where people are shopping i think find more locally which is great yeah so yeah. i mean we've had no disruption of product supply except in paper products yeah the the example that i use is um i walk into every store and there's plenty of broccoli our, yes, our buying exactly. habits for broccoli never changed and so there's not a shortage of broccoli so if we all just went back to our normal buying habits we wouldn't have a shortage of products right so um, maybe there's something catchy i can put together there and send it out to you guys i'm not sure <laughs> but um if we just we, if we, we just went too. back to our yeah yeah i'm i am more than happy to to partner with with legislature with the legislature in in getting a message out to to consumers um i'm i'm happy to send a message to to my members as well i just i think that it's um it's more beneficial to for the co consumers to hear from their leaders than from the retailer um but again i'm willing to to work with you however i can okay right well, I appreciate that, and we'll be back in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you time. so much. Okay. So, committee, uh, one last thing uh, is I sent out an email about meeting from 9:30 to 11:45 on Tuesdays through Fridays. Fine. Week, next week, does that work for everybody? Yep. Randy, is that okay with you? What is that? <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> I can't. He, he's he's getting on. back he's his something. audio. What's that? He's getting oh, back. He's disappearing. Spirit? He just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's there. He was playing a joke. All right. So probably the next uh, uh, meeting will be at 9.30 on Tuesday. Okay. okay, Randy? Okay, I'm back. I was trying to get unmuted here. Oh, okay. Uh, those times and dates are fine. Okay, great. Have a good Senator, weekend, everybody, if you can. As, Senator, as you depart, please mention that you are now ending live stream so people are clear the meeting's over. I'm sure we have a large audience. <laughs> We're now ending live stream. Thank you.